the amount of projects out there related to energy storage products that are waiting to be fulfilled, even if a small percentage of them, even if a large percentage of them don't come to fruition, it still signifies a gigantic increase of uh, projects year over year. And as the needs around uh, like power for artificial intelligence projects rise, as uh, the third world enters the second world and the second world enters the first world, so on and so forth, and the needs of the first world countries continue to increase. Um, and there's just so much demand for an improved grid, grid system that the forcing function for energy storage solutions and batteries at the core, this technology, the battery technology becoming a a uh the primary like the new oil is the freaking battery is like it's it's all there it's all there and we should look no further than than how heavy china is going into it even in a situation where demand for the systems that require this battery is down let's say electric vehicles they're still growing it they're still investing heavily into it because they know that if they can position themselves in a, in a place where they can corner as much of the raw materials and even the batteries as much as they can, they control a lot of, and they get to dictate a lot of how transportation and energy systems will pan out in the future, which, you know, when we spoke with Michael Dunn, who is uh, somebody that vis visited Asian countries very often with the intention of learning about what they're doing from a vehicle perspective, energy perspective, battery perspective, so on and so forth. It's becoming, and Hans talked about it briefly here, it's becoming a matter of national security for countries to secure as much of this as they can. And with the United States and Tesla specifically, you have uh, the ability to do that. You just have to make sure the support's there for the... Uh, for the company to actually be successful long term, or not even that, because of the the economics of it make make too much sense for people to pass up. So maybe that's like the ultimate thing that gets this thing to be adopted. It's just the economics are too good. So yeah, and I was just looking at my um my battery supply forecast, and I was assuming that there's uh like six terawatt hours of battery supply, and I assumed like a one terawatt hour shortfall. So I think we're at like um one a little over one terawatt hour of global battery supply right now so that would have to be a 6x in the next like six years so i, I don't think that's going to happen um at this point um, but we will see how things emerge because things are changing so fast uh just like in the past year i've had to completely change my uh, perspective on te tesla's lithium supply issue because they've changed their demand uh, we don't know how things are going to be a year from now. So it could change in the next year or two. If I could pick one time to be alive in human history, this would be it. There's so much cool stuff happening right now, especially with Elon. Okay, so we only covered cost as like the primary advantage of this uh, dry, dry cathode. Uh, the other thing is scalability. The main thing that Tesla said at Investor Day, and they said this a few times before and during Investor Day, or not Investor Day, Battery Day, was this allows us to be the masters of our own destiny. They don't have to dick around with suppliers. If they want batteries, they can just produce them, and they can ramp much faster than they could in-house versus using an external supplier. And then also, uh, so the third reason why this is important, and this goes back to the masters of their own destiny thing, is the huge global reliance on the te on china's supply chain it looks like besides china the only other entity in the world that's going to have its own vertically integrated supply chain would be tesla so if there is some sort of geopolitical issue with china tesla's going to be only the only company that can produce batteries <laughs> and produce electric vehicles so this is why elon was saying at the annual meeting that the importance of this will become apparent over time tesla will be independent of china's supply chain if they continue down this path the urgency around that from let's say other players that are building vehicles the lack of urgency is like is shocking to me it really is shocking. And, and the more I have conversations about this, and you know, for people to follow the Tesla story closely, the, the one hypothesis that we've all had for a really long time is that legacy automakers are in, in a world of hurt because as electric vehicles become uh, adopted uh, over time and the technologies and the materials necessary to make, make an electric vehicle go down in price, it becomes a no brainer transition. Yet, it, the, the, it looks so obvious. It looks so painfully clear. And we're seeing the opposite happening by a lot of these. They're, they're pulling back. They're saying, no, we're good. Y'all can have it. 
we'll figure out how to make this thing work without it. And then y'all can have it right to the point where it's like, I just, I don't think anybody can, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably a lot more esoteric than I'm giving it credit for, but it's just becoming so obvious, so painfully obvious that so many players are so far behind this. They're just dropped the ball on this massively. And yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to. I don't want to preach to the choir too much because yeah, now's the time. Now's the time to put the pressure on. There's there's a little bit of a lull, and Tesla's still pushing forward, and everybody else is pulling back. And when this starts, um, when we get to the next leg of this, um, all these companies are going to be uh, as far behind as they ever were. They should be going crazy now. Exactly. They should be going crazy. Like this is the time to go crazy. The only company that I see that's doing that, Jim Farley, mm -hmm. is making all the right noises in terms of his focus on the uh, the wiring system and the software. That's where it's all at. That's what makes these mm -hmm. the unboxed process truly possible. And that's what makes um, a fully connected next generation vehicle that's like an entertainment platform possible. Those two things, wiring and software. The frustrating thing with Farley though is like he's been saying the right things for a while. It's just their execution has not been there. You know, if you, if you look at their success, if you look at how much they're losing per car, it's like, Hopefully they can turn around, but man. Well, to me, it's it's uh, they're learning the right lessons from what they're doing, and they're pouring all this into their skunk works. I don't know if you've heard him talk about this before, but it's it's something that they started on a couple years ago, and it's not going to be revealed for another year or two. Now, whether that's going to happen soon enough to save the company is a different story. But the is um, they are investing in the right areas. I'll come back to that in in just a second. But I was going to say on the the independent supply chain side of things for Tesla, it also ties in with you know, the conversation that we were having with Michael Dunn about just leverage and Tesla being very uh, aware and adept at using leverage in, negotiated, in negotiations with the Chinese uh, Communist Party to do things that, you know, having, having that independent supply chain means that there's one less way for the CCP to twist Tesla's arm in future negotiations and that they don't have a way to, you know, prevent Elon from moving forward with his plans uh, because he has that one, you know, critical bottleneck that he's held up by. Um, but then coming back to Jim Farley and and Ford, like, do you do you think that they have, you know, they have learned enough and that there's a good path forward for them? with whatever this skunk works vehicle is like how soon does it need to come out and how great does it have to be in order to provide them a leg to stand on moving forward i don't know what um position they're in re with regards to bankruptcy <laughs> so i haven't looked at their financials but in terms of they are saying mm. the right things they're talking about moving two or three step they're basically following tesla's playbook and um integrating mm their engineers into the supply chain. So they have people working at other factories, helping design these electronics, et cetera, and um, moving to what it sounds like to me, more like a zonal architecture where the controllers can do more. And it gives you more control over uh, the vehicle itself. And that requires not just hardware, but also you have to be helping program the software as well. So they're reaching deeper into the supply chains, vertically integrating. Well, and given that they're focused on, you know, those electronics components and software and, and networking, what do you think the likelihood is that they are one of those OEMs that is in discussion with Tesla to license FSD? Because, I mean, Ford's, you know, Jim has been talking about their ambitions to do this themselves. I think they're the highest likelihood company, and that's a really good point. It's something I've been thinking about every time I hear Jim Farley repeating something that Elon said a couple of years ago. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, uh, you're, uh, you're learning from the best. You're learning from the master. And uh, uh, Jim is uh, thankfully humble enough to do that. And I, I do think that, I mean, if you look at all these other companies, I don't see why any other, why any company, if Tesla comes out ahead with full self-driving, why anybody would use anybody's software but Tesla? Because if you use somebody else's software, um, you're going to, there's going to be a highly higher likelihood of people dying because they have less data, less compute and all this other stuff. So it's a safety thing. 
And I think the way Tesla is going to get around the monopoly concerns is uh, I think they're going to be fair and open. And um, I, I wouldn't say they're going to open source it like they have with their patents, but they have to take a similar approach because they're going to be earning so many profits and have such a stranglehold on the market that they have to keep the pressure from regulators and stuff off of them. But I think, yeah, I do think Ford is positioning themselves and following Tesla's lead with their architecture so they can adopt Tesla's full self-driving. But Ford aside, I don't see why anybody would use any other system because I mean, it's, you know, it's people's lives. It's safety. And it's, and it's obviously getting done with, especially with the recent improvements with 12.5.1.2 that's being tested right now by Tesla. It's it's becoming increasingly obvious that it's going to happen. Like there, there's the limiting factor is no longer there, which was how much compute hardware you needed, right? And I think another thing we want to talk, talk about was compute uh, training, compute versus inference compute, uh, if you still want to. But I think the um, the one thing that also became apparent with Michael Dunn was when we had him on on, on the podcast was that Chinese automakers are not afraid to borrow or copy or whatever word you want to use the winning technology, right? They seem to operate with a lot less ego or let's say they have a hand that's forcing their <laughs> what they need to do that will potentially land them in a, in a situation where they could craft a vision only solution that sort of sheds a lot of the burden that comes from having a Waymo-like system of uh, LiDAR, ultrasonics, HD maps, so on and so forth, that makes it very costly to create a, elect uh, a self-driving car plus extremely difficult to scale, right? Just, just today, it was announced that BYD is partnering with Uber to provide 100,000 self-driving vehicles for Uber to operate in their fleet, right? And then Elon replied to that, and he's like, uh, BYD needs to change the strategy or their toast. And I think what he was sort of insinuating there is like, hey, if y'all don't adopt vision plus inference compute, aka license from me, because it's going to be very expensive for you to do what I'm doing, you're screwed, right? Um, so, but but I do wonder how many Chinese players will adopt FSD versus like a Ford or so on and so forth. Because I think I think it's more, and I think Hans, you you may have brought this up last time we spoke or one of the times we spoke, is I, I'm becoming, I'm warming up to the idea that it's more likely for a Chinese automaker to adopt FSD before uh, a legacy automaker does, like a, like a European or American one, because they don't have that, oh, that ego, or that, no, we got it, or it's not that important, like, there's too much risk here. It's like, no, we, we should probably adopt this, because if we don't, we're, we're become obsolete because why would anybody want to drive, buy a car you have to drive yourself when you can just buy a car that drives itself? Yeah, the president of Xiaopeng has come over to the U.S. and he's driven a Tesla and he's they've even got some like Xiaopeng branded uh, content where he's reacting to the two different systems. And um, I think it was Herbert who was saying that it this feels to him like they're warming up the possibility of Xiaopeng licensing FSD from Tesla. And I think that is one possibility. I, I'm i sure that if not Xiaopeng, then another one of the, the companies in China would love to do that. Like uh, there's going to definitely be at least one, if not multiples in China that would, if Tesla would allow them to. But I think that raises a very legitimate question in my mind of whether or not that is something that Elon should be open to like i don't particularly think that it would be wise to open up well i don't know like i i have competing sets of thoughts on this on the one hand i think from a safety perspective that that would be a win for humanity on the other hand i think that we need to maintain some life in the United States auto manufacturing world. And I personally think I would prioritize doing deals with Western automakers first, and then maybe not, you know, say no to China forever, but maybe holding them off for a little while until we can make sure that we've got a little bit of an edge there just from a technology standpoint. 
because they're obviously going to be, you know, trying to copy the approach regardless of whether they license it right away. And I think that they'll have all the resources at their disposal to be probably the fastest, you know, set of entities to reproduce what Tesla has done, you know, from scratch. 